1878. A revolution is underway in the understanding of disease. Ultimately, its effect is to be universal. But at this moment, just a few seeds have been sown, and few men perceive what they may become. The Beauce Plateau, near Chartres. As in many districts of France, dead sheep strew the fields. A scourge keeps the flocks off otherwise good land. Already distinguished in science, Louis Pasteur has resolved to do something about the disease of anthrax. I don't know what Chambelon is complaining about. All he has to do is feed a few thistles to some sheep. Just so, sir, but it's not so easy. It may not be easy, Monsieur Roux. But it is science. The anthrax germ had been identified and isolated in a liquid culture, but how animals contract the disease is a mystery. One of Pasteur's assistants, Chambonon, is conducting an experiment to test a theory of Pasteur's that sheep pick up the spores of the microbe with the food they eat. Chambonon is feeding the sheep contaminated thistles. This was the way that things were done. Pasteur had the imaginative ideas. His dedicated assistants carried them out, not always with good grace. Oh, come on, come on. Eat the damn stuff, can't you? Can't you see the great man has arrived? Splendid news, sir. Another two have just died. Excellent. Have the autopsies been performed? Well, we usually do those in the mornings. I should like you to do them straight away, if you please. Now nearly 56, Pasteur was still suffering from his stroke of 10 years earlier. But the most adventurous period of his life was about to begin. The aim of the team was to establish precisely how, year after year, animals contracted the disease. They knew they were involved in a hazardous undertaking. Handling anthrax germs was extremely dangerous. Men could also succumb to the disease. Is it proving difficult? The wretched beasts don't like it. Can't say I blame them. Roux was the only qualified medical man on the team. Always practical, he was deeply suspicious of Pasteur's sometimes extravagant theorizing, and he disliked being ordered around. How these tiny germs could so quickly overcome a large animal fascinated Pasteur. Nevertheless, he was convinced that the anthrax germ alone was responsible for the death of the sheep. Autopsies supported this. All he had to do now was to satisfy his doubting opponents. We cannot be certain until the bacteria or their spores have been completely isolated and freed of every foreign element. Why does the disease happen only in certain areas? Why does it happen only in summer? And finally, how does it manage to lie dormant for such long periods before becoming active again? How can a single organism result in these anomalies? I say there must be some other cause. <laughs> Professor Collar continues to believe in another agent because he wishes it were so. This only proves his obstinate refusal to take into account the real truth contained in the experiments conducted by Herr Koch and others, including myself, in which it was proved conclusively that no other virulent agent exists. May I remind Monsieur Pasteur that I have made over 500 experiments in anthrax over the past 12 years? Then may I suggest that Monsieur Collin is not as competent with a microscope as you would like to think? Oh. I observe seriously, I experiment seriously, and I believe I have the right to be taken seriously. 
Pasteur was well aware that much of the criticism levelled at him was valid. He could not say with certainty why the disease behaved as it did, why, for example, the disease happened only in certain areas and how it managed to lie dormant for such long periods. These seemingly simple microorganisms had a lot to explain. Of course. When an animal dies, where does it go? What? Why, back to the earth, where it falls. And then perhaps months later, perhaps years later, the spores from the dead body rise to the surface and reinfect other animals. How? How do the spores rise to the surface? But would they retain their virulence all that time? Why not? We find it difficult enough to get rid of them as it is. By what means could the spores return to the surface? The solution was suggested by a shrewd observation and an inspired guess. I think you've found it. Earthworms. Well, it's possible, I suppose. It was almost too simple to be true. And please don't come back. This really is most distracting. Eager to confirm his theory, Pasteur found the visitors his assistants liked to invite an unwelcome intrusion. The laboratory was for him a place for concentration and discipline. Do we understand each other, gentlemen? Back to your work, please. Back to your work. How we deal, Dick. What a way to spend one's youth. Earthworms. If his discipline in the laboratory appeared unpalatable, it did at least produce results. Anthrax spores were discovered in the earth cylinders which filled their intestinal tube. I would not be surprised if at the moment the Academy doubted the veracity of these facts. However, earthworms are the messengers of the germs, and it is they which, from the depth of the burial, bring back to the surface of the soil the terrifying parasite. Excellent. Let them contest that. Herr Koch, will he agree? Why shouldn't he? He hasn't advanced any theory of his own. But how would you have felt if somebody had tried to improve on your work on silkworms? I should have been delighted. <laughs> Science does not belong to any one man. Koch did not invent anthrax. The man's a plagiarist. He not only misinterprets my work, he wants to take all the credit for it as well. <laughs> they say that he's also claiming that the sheep that died of the infected thistles contracted the disease through scratches in their mouths and pharynx. But everybody knows that anthrax is an intestinal disease. He's not unknown, you know. Monsieur Pasteur is a man of note. Don't you think it might be as well to listen to his theories instead of dismissing them out of hand? Gertrude? I am not dismissing them out of hand. All I'm saying is that to listen to him talk, anybody would think it was he, not I, that discovered the cause of anthrax. <laughs> well, there's nothing new in that at all. There's a sort of facile neatness in the idea. As for his theory that it's the earthworms that are bringing the spores to the surface, if anything, they would destroy the spores. And has the man never learnt of the pathogenic action of worms? Hmm? <laughs> You'd better have your soup. Your evening patients will be here any moment. <clears throat> Several years earlier, Koch had brilliantly demonstrated the entire life cycle of the anthrax bacillus only to lose the initiative to Pasteur. Still living in the humble circumstances of a German country doctor, he had nothing but his animals and his inventive imagination to further his scientific interests. Positions, please. And here is the shutter string. Koch was now pioneering the hitherto unheard of technique of photographing microbes. It's just coming, Papa. Now! His equipment he sometimes improvised. I hope they're smiling. 
or purchased out of his own modest salary. <laughs> Armed with his new equipment, he set out to identify, indisputably, specific bacteria. But Koch was cut off from an audience with whom he could discuss his work. He had to resort to a personal approach. In June 1878, the most powerful man in German medicine, Rudolf Virchow, favoured him with an appointment in Berlin. And these are my photographic plates of the bacilli of gangrene, septicemia, and erysipelas. As a rule here, Professor, it's impossible to measure them at all accurately or hold them still long enough to sketch, <laughs> of course, but I've developed ways of staining them with dyes. I find methylene blue most effective. And then, photographing them. Mm, interesting. I cannot take it seriously. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand, Herr Professor. Well, this business of bacteria floating around in the air is hardly serious medicine. It leaves far too many questions unanswered. Yes, for example, why is it that you and I could be sitting in the same room at the same time, and yet you can track cholera and I don't? <laughs> well, it's not a question of them um, settling like a cloud, Herr Professor. When I studied it in Eastern Silesia, there was no doubt in my mind what caused cholera. Poor food. Bad sanitation, inadequate housing, yes, even the lack of education. I too have seen cholera, Herr Professor, in the war with Austria. There was a particularly... The trouble with you strange. people is you take a simplistic view of life. Nothing in science can be caused by only one thing. Imagine a bacillus as a disease. Maybe a hundred causes. Yes, what about environment and tuberculosis? Between heredity and thysis. But these things may be relevant to bacteria. My dear doctor, I was researching embolism and leukemia before you were born. Don't tell me what may or may not be relevant in a diagnosis. Stubborn professional pride on the one hand and common ignorance on the other was at the root of the human suffering that both Koch and Pasteur saw around them. Pasteur now increasingly ventured into hospitals, and although his approach differed greatly from Koch's, the objectives of both men were the same. Isolate the microbe and link it irrefutably with the disease. These are the instruments we use, monsieur. Forceps, decapitation hooks. You flame them before use? No, sir. Do you do nothing else? We wash them thoroughly, sir. In boiling water, of course. No, in warm water, but we use plenty of soap. And the dressings? This is the kind of stuff, sir. Best calico, very absorbent. You sterilize it before using it? No, sir, we use it just as it is, but you can see that it is clean. We do what we can, sir. Yes, all right, sister. You have some patients for us to see. Yes, if you would. Over here. Fifteen years after Lister. And they still won't listen. No steam treatment, no flaming, no antiseptics. These women are dying of purple fever. And every one of them could be saved. Today, we have been hearing a great deal about diseases which are caused by organisms floating in the air. This is dangerous nonsense. But fortunately, the great art of medicine has always survived its opponents. As for disease, did not our great master Hippocrates himself tell us it is caused by bad <coughs> odors drawn down into the body and then expelled to infect others? These miasmas are well known. <coughs> Purple fever is a good example. It is certainly not caused by one of these microorganisms which are so widely distributed in nature and in the midst of whom we live without being troubled by them. Ignorance and rejection of the new ideas existed at all levels. But until there was a practical outcome to the research into the role of microbes, could the experimenters, as they were called, expect otherwise? 
Seek the microbe, Rue. There's always the microbe. There's nothing being done. Nothing! It's happened. We're going to Berlin. They've confirmed my appointment. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe it. They, they're offering me a laboratory and two assistants. You mean we're leaving here? Well, of course. It's a wonderful opportunity to work with the right equipment. And, and in Berlin, we'll be right at the center of things. Never. What do you, what, what do you mean? I've no wish to leave Waldstein. It suits me here. Well, what about my work? Your work? <laughs> you call it work? These animals, the stink of the place, and now you want to start all over again in Berlin? Here we have friends. Here we have a position. What can Berlin offer against that? I take up my appointment in five days. We leave immediately. In July 1880, Koch proudly took up his appointment at the finest school of medical science in Europe. It was an opportunity to join the mainstream of microbiological research he so desperately needed. Herr Dr. Koch, I'm Herr Dr. Löffler. Ah, welcome to Berlin. Thank you. Chance, Pasteur had once said, only favors the mind that is prepared. And it was sheer good fortune that was to prove his benefactor. He and his nephew, the newly recruited Adrian Loire, were embarked on the study of a germ that attacked poultry, killing 90 out of 100 in an infected area. In any operation involving the preparation of pure cultures of the microbe, Pasteur always insisted on absolute silence and stillness, believing that a disturbance in the air would stir up the dust and contaminate his cultures. They passed drops of infected liquid from one flask to another. Each flask contained a nutrient on which only the microbe would thrive. Then when all other impurities had been eliminated, and only then, would the live chicken be inoculated with the inevitable outcome. Going already, Mr. Chambelon? We did say we might leave early, as we all start our holidays tomorrow. Ah, yes. <laughs> well, would you kindly inoculate the hens with this culture before you leave? Yes, monsieur. Having carried out hundreds of inoculations into live hens, Chambolin saw little harm in this single omission. After his holiday, Chambolin returned to be confronted with the culture that Pasteur had given him two weeks before. 
Chambolin inoculated the hens. Against all expectation, they did not die. Are you sure that you used the culture that I gave you? Yes, monsieur. When did you inject? Well, I have to admit, three days ago on my return. Mm. Well, perhaps it was a bad batch. Let's start again. More chickens? Yes. And, but re-inject these chickens as well. And this time, Monsieur Chamblon, make sure the culture is fresh. The inoculations with fresh culture were carried out. The new batch of hens died, but the hens that survived the first injection survived the second also. Extraordinary. They're healthy enough. Chambron. We must reproduce deliberately every stage of what you did by accident. Now, are you quite sure that nothing has happened to that culture that you haven't told me about? Quite sure. Right. And starting from the very beginning, we'll inject again. Right. The culture that you, Mr. Chambolon, left lying about and exposed to the air has somehow become weakened. I've given them the disease in a benign form. Yes, but still strong enough to stimulate their defenses against the later injections of the virulent microbe. You mean they've been given a, a sort of immunity against further attacks? Exactly. Thanks to Monsieur Chambolin's negligence, gentlemen, I think we may have a vaccine. <laughs> you should go on holiday more often. This was the first time a vaccine had been produced from the same microbe which had carried the disease. Now Pasteur determined to apply the same principle to the anthrax bacillus. Immediately there were problems. Far from weakening the anthrax bacillus, exposure to air simply allowed the spores to go on growing and it was the spores which gave the disease its perniciousness. A way had to be found of killing the spores and leaving a weakened bacillus. We know that the spores are heat sensitive. At above 42 degrees, they no longer fall. Cock showed us that. Now, how does that help us? Very little, because heat also kills the bacilli, making them useless as a vaccine. But are we absolutely sure that the bacilli are killed at 42 degrees, or even 43, or 44? Well, what difference does that make? Well, it could mean that there is perhaps a range of several degrees above 42 at which the bacilli survive enough to produce a vaccine. Put those in the incubator. It was an inspired observation, and experiment confirmed it. February the 18th, 1881, the Academy of Sciences. The virulence of the anthrax microbe is lost after heating for eight days at a temperature of 42 to 43 degrees. Field experiments have shown that guinea pigs, rabbits, and sheep gain an immunity to the disease when inoculated with a vaccine which has been successfully weakened by the method I have described. Perhaps Monsieur Pasteur would explain to us the process of attenuation. I have done so. The microbe is affected by exposure to the air. But surely Monsieur Pasteur has already told us that the spores of the anthrax bacillus are resistant to the atmosphere for an indefinite period. As witness his theory of infected soil. The secret lies in the temperature. Uh -uh. No admittance. Yes, but he'll want to see this. Not until this evening. But this concerns us all. 
Rossignol has issued a challenge. A challenge? It's true. Listen to this. Microbes are in fashion. Pasteur the pontiff has claimed that the microbe alone is responsible for anthrax. These are sacramental words I have spoken. So he challenges him to a public demonstration of the anthrax vaccine in the districts of Mellon, Fontainebleau and Provins. Do you think he'll accept? Of course he will accept. Have you ever known the master turn down a challenge? Never. That's half the trouble. Uh, you have agreed that the demonstration should take place at the farm of Puy Four near Mela in May. That is correct. For which the Mela Agricultural Society have placed 60 sheep at your disposal. Uh, 25 of these sheep will be inoculated with your anti-anthrax vaccine at 12 or 15 days interval. Some days later, these 25, together with our 25 untreated sheep, will be inoculated with virulent anthrax culture. Is that correct? The 25 unvaccinated sheep will all perish. Afterwards, the survivors, if any, will be compared with 10 sheep who have had no treatment whatsoever. The 25 vaccinated sheep will all live. Excellent. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me. And why didn't you consult us? Well, I saw no reason to. But you've left yourself no room for a treat. I wasn't aware that I needed any. The vaccine, monsieur, the vaccine is still unreliable. Unless it's kept at the exact temperature, it doesn't work. Do you know how difficult that is in laboratory conditions? How could you agree to use it under these circumstances? The vaccine will be just as good on 50 sheep at Pui as it was on 14 in the laboratory. No! <clears throat> Forgive me, Dr. Rue, but, uh, well, is there any alternative? Yes. Sean Blanc and I have been working on another vaccine. Another vaccine? Well, we should have told you, I suppose. I dare say we'd have got round to it in the end. Hmm. It's true. We would have told you. It's we... outrageous! When I've published to the world that my vaccine is infallible, my own assistance... It's the oxidation that's the trouble, monsieur. The trouble? It's the whole basis of the attenuation. How can you question it? It doesn't always work. And as for the matter of temperature, we'll never keep it up. Half a degree out and one single spore could make it ineffective. You know that. You know how difficult it is to do here, and you expect us to guarantee in a farmyard that every single one of those injections will be free of spores? I say it will work. No. You can't be sure. One mistake, just one mistake, and those sheep will die. Now, our method is to treat the bacteria with bichromate of potassium. Yes, and it does work. Always, each time. You can't take the risk of using anything else. You must forget oxidation by exposure. Never. Oxidation is my text. I can't run the risk of using a vaccine that I know nothing about. Then you will fail. And this challenge will destroy you. Puy Le Four, near Melun, May the 5th, 1882. The first inoculations were to be given to the animals that were to be protected against anthrax. At a time when scientific demonstrations had a certain novelty, this public experiment became a national event. A wager at the time would have produced odds well against a successful outcome. The medical and veterinary community was by and large skeptical. Most people had gathered in anticipation of witnessing the wholesale slaughter of 50 sheep. Pasteur had decided they would use Roux's chemically prepared vaccine. But immensely jealous of his own reputation, the world was not to be told.
Carry on, Mr. Lee. More than Pasteur's personal reputation was at stake, the failure of such a well-publicized and large-scale experiment would be disastrous for the concept of vaccination for years to come. Immunity to the disease would be affected by two inoculations of the weakened bacilli. The second, stronger than the first, would follow after an interval of two weeks. Each would induce a mild attack of the disease. Marie wrote to her cousin. May 17th. The 25 sheep have survived their first inoculations. Today, a second inoculation will be made with a stronger culture. Down you go, then. Roux and Chambeland are in constant attendance on the sheep. So far, they have found nothing abnormal. Louis no longer feels such great confidence about the outcome and is becoming increasingly anxious. I always was impatient. Sometimes I think I'm totally unfitted by nature for my profession. Nothing can be hurried. You know that better than anyone. May the 31st. Today, all the animals were to be inoculated with the anthrax bacillus. In the crowd were the skeptics, as usual, and also Monsieur Collin, still smarting from regular confrontations with Pasteur. Monsieur Biot! Always suspicious of other men's work, Collin was convinced that trickery would be involved. Am I right in thinking you will be with Pasteur when he inoculates the animals today? That is so, Monsieur Collin. Mm. I don't trust him. Who, Monsieur? Pasteur. Look, the anthrax liquid will be in two parts. I don't understand. At the top will be the more inert material, almost harmless. At the bottom will be the more virulent the weight of the bacteria having caused them to sink. Now, I believe that Pasteur will attempt to inoculate his own animals from the upper part to improve his chances of success. The moment has come. Monsieur Pasteur, here is the anthrax bacillus to be injected into all the sheep. Mr. Biot, what are you doing? Making sure that each of the animals receives an equal portion of the virulence, Monsieur Pasteur. <laughs> to satisfy you, Monsieur, we will inject a triple dose into each sheep. And you'll inoculate the vaccinated and unvaccinated alternately, Monsieur Pasteur? It shall be done exactly as you wish, sir. With the injections of the virulent anthrax bacillus, there could be no turning back. It would take four days for the bacillus to become effective. On the fourth night, Roux and Champollion made a final examination of the sheep for any sign of infection. They were due to report back to Pasteur in Paris. I expected you sooner. Well? Well, there's no doubt the unvaccinated sheep is coming. The, the breathlessness is at a maximum. They can barely walk. Three of them are dead already. Yes, yes, but what of the vaccinated ones? They also are sickening. What? It's true. 
Several have developed a temperature one over 40 degrees. Another has presented edema at the point of inoculation. Are you sure? This has never happened before. There's no doubt. Oh, what could have gone wrong? The vaccine has never failed. Well, what did Monsieur Rossignol say? He believes that um, all of them will die during the night. I should never have listened to you. What do I know of your vaccine? This would never have happened with mine. To be destroyed now, with success in our grasp, and the whole world watching. That's too much. The cruelest thing about this is that if it fails, the world will never again believe my theory. There's only one thing for it. You must return to the farm alone. I won't face the ridicule and sarcasm of those people. It was your arrogance that brought it about, and you must suffer the humiliation. And now please leave me. My vaccine have failed. It's too soon to talk of failure. Have faith in Rue. Like the old days. We worked all night, hardly slept. <laughs> oh, I need your strength. You have enough of your own. When you arrive this afternoon, all the non-vaccinated sheep will be dead. Eighteen have already died, and the others are dying. As to the vaccinated ones, they are all well. He ends. It's a stunning success. of little faith. and repentant sin. Your theory has been proved to the hilt. Well, the Gospels tell us that there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. <laughs> Pasteur had emerged triumphant with the help of Rue's chemically prepared vaccine. But still the world was not to be told. Koch, however, was dubious and responded in no uncertain terms. It is tempting to believe in the possibility of a vaccine for anthrax, but I don't accept what Pasteur claims. Something more than oxidation must have been involved. Some chemical, perhaps. After Pasteur's discovery, the work in Koch's Berlin laboratory was taking on a new importance. All efforts were devoted to the study of a particular human disease. It killed one in every seven people in Europe, the killer tuberculosis. In virtually every home, it was commonplace for at least one member of a family to be suffering from, dying of, or dead from consumption. If only they could produce a vaccine. 
Like Pasteur, Koch was a fervent nationalist. His country's honor spurred him on. The TB bacilli were extremely small, perhaps one-tenth of the size of anthrax microbes. The search for them had been a struggle, but at last the bacilli had been identified. We can see the bacilli well enough. I wish we could grow them as easily. I inoculated these nine days ago. We should have seen something by now. Well, we must start again. Always meticulous, he took one last look before throwing his cultures away. Dr. Leffler. Now that Koch had grown the bacilli, he was well on the way to producing a vaccine. And I was going to throw them away. But for a time, competition with Pasteur was to intervene. In July 1883, Pasteur was given finance by the French government to investigate an outbreak of cholera in Egypt. Louis Thuillet was a candidate for the expedition. Excuse me, sir. Oh, it's you. What is it? I've... I've made my decision. Come and sit down, Louis. Thank you, sir. Now then. I've made my decision. In spite of my parents' opposition, and if Dr. Rue will accept me, I should like to accompany him to Alexandria. I see. You realize the risks? I do, sir. Have you ever seen cholera? Yes. Yes, I have. Morning and night you will be in contact with the infection in all its forms. I do understand that, sir. You still want to go? I do. Well, I mustn't dissuade you. But remember, you will be going in the name of science and of France. By the time Roux and Thuillet reached Alexandria, the outbreak of cholera was claiming a startling 500 deaths a day. The smell of death pervaded the entire city. Pasteur had instructed them to stay at the best hotel and to eat only fresh food. But they were without doubt putting themselves at grave risk of a horrifying infection. Roux and Thuillet arrived at the French hospital in Alexandria to set up their temporary laboratory unaware that they were only a few days ahead of their German rival. National pride ensured the independent involvement of the investigating teams. Only 10 days after the French arrival, the Germans, headed by Koch himself, arrived and found separate working accommodation for themselves in the Greek hospital. Each team brought to their task their own particular techniques. Koch, his sophisticated photographic equipment, and more important, the well-developed concept of growing microbes on solid cultures. The French, on the other hand, were using the well-tried but less effective liquid cultures. This increased the difficulties of isolating germs taken from the stools of cholera patients, which contained dozens of microbes, any one of which could have been the cholera germ. There was also the problem of the great heat, which was even melting the semi-solid gelatin Koch was using for his cultures. Later, open ice boxes were used. But there were other problems. The epidemic seemed to be dying out in Alexandria, and there was even a shortage of dead bodies for dissection, for they were all taken away and burnt. The French found the situation nearly hopeless. Faced with such a confusion of organisms in their liquid culture, their task was extremely difficult. 
They'd started by examining the intestinal contents of the cholera patients, but were now concentrating on blood specimens. By contrast, in the German laboratories, there was a sense of quiet confidence. I have carried out 10 post-mortems of 12 choleric patients. In all the corpses, I have found a comma-shaped bacillus embedded in the intestinal wall. Using mucus flakes and a 10% weak alkaline nutrient gelatin, I have succeeded in cultivating the bacillus which may be the cholera vibrio. There they are again. Small black grains in the blood. I agree. It's too much of a coincidence. The culture fails to affect animals. And yet this is the only organism that we've found in every infected case. Well, there's nothing else. No. In September, Koch and Loeffler were startled to hear that the French team was claiming to have found the cholera germ and was preparing to go back to France. They asked permission to examine their findings. Well, Herr Professor. Thank you, gentlemen. Koch and Loeffler went back with much relief to their open ice boxes, for they knew that what the French had found were platelets in the blood and not the cholera germ. The epidemic had ceased unexpectedly. <laughs> Roux and Tuyer could relax utterly. And after all, hadn't they found what they'd come for? Come on! There was to be a triumphal return home. With his embarkation imminent, Tuye made the most of his last days in Alexandria. Thank you. Well, who's all this stuff for, anyway? Well, uh, relatives, friends. With this, this carpet, that's for my mother. The fly whisk, that's for my father. Uh, oh, this shawl, that's for a, a sister of a friend of mine. <coughs> these, uh, these bits and pieces, they're there for uh, my, my cousins in Orleans. <laughs> well, I always buy things when I go away. Sometimes, you know, just sometimes, Mark, you, I find your enthusiasm almost bearable. Come along. Let's go and have a drink. Help me when you want to know. Help me. 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 Help me
Sheets are soaking. Get some liquid. Drink this. It was all right last night. We were. We were swimming. I'll get clean linen in the blankets. Thank you. There's a good chap. Try and drink it. He's a good fellow. By dint of all our strength, we protracted the struggle for nearly four days. By then, the asphyxia, which had lasted 24 hours, was stronger than our efforts. Tuye then made one last strange appeal to see Koch. Yes. This blow is altogether incomprehensible. It was more than a fortnight since we'd seen a single new case of cholera. Of us all, Tuye was the one who took most precautions. He was irreproachably careful. The French colony and the medical staff are thunderstruck. Your own feelings will help you to imagine our grief. Splendid funeral honors have been rendered to our dear Tuye. It is a simple wreath, but it is of laurel, and it is for the brave. He was buried at four o'clock on Wednesday afternoon with the finest and most imposing manifestation Alexandra had seen for a long time. Want of time forces me to close this letter. Pray believe in our respectful affection. Rest now. There's nothing you can do. 